Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Gals Podcast. Sharon Vornholt is your host and the creator of the Louisville Gals Real Estate Blog, where you will learn how to become a savvy real estate investor, make money, build streams of passive income, and create a lifestyle and a business you love. Whether you're a seasoned real estate investor or just getting started, this show is for you. Now, let's talk real estate investing. This is Sharon Bornholt with the Louisville Gals Real Estate Blog here today with another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. My guest today is Sean Riley from Newton, Massachusetts. Sean is the owner of Riley Real Estate, and he's a busy rehabber, and he's also a family man that includes his wife and two daughters. So I want to thank Sean for taking the time out to come on the show today. I'm glad to have you today, Sean. It's great to be here, Sharon. Um, let's start off and have you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate. Uh, well, so um, as you said, I'm in, I am live in Massachusetts, been here my whole life. Um, you know, went to school here, went to college here, met my wife here. Um, she's not from here, but she went to school <laughs> here. Um, you know, started working, was interested in, you know, building a retirement, building financial freedom, um, got interested in real estate as, you know, a vehicle for that. You know, I looked into other things too, like stocks and, um, you know, starting my own businesses on real estate related, that sort of stuff as well. But real estate was something that definitely um, was of more interest to me than most of the other things. And, uh, you know, after a lot of a lot of studying and inaction, mm-hmm. we did eventually become, uh, we started off as accidental landlords. We bought – so the market here, uh, I think, peaked a little earlier than in some other places, probably like 2004, 2005. So we bought, I would say, on the wrong end of a flip uh, for <laughs> our first our first uh, primary residence in 2004. Around 2007, we wanted to move, uh, get a slightly bigger place as we started thinking about starting a family. Um Around here, you get um, a lot of older homes. You also have a lot of condos. So our first home was a 686-square-foot two-bedroom condo, so not exactly where you're going to raise your family. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why we were looking into that. But anyway, so I said we um, bought in 2004. We went to sell in 2007. do not have to be a genius to figure out that was not necessarily the best economic plan. So... Um, it's actually very close to Boston College, and we had always joked, oh, man, it would be nice if we could move and not have to sell this place because it would make a good rental. So uh, when we realized we'd probably eat about $30,000 if we just sold it, we were like, well, let's see if we can make that work. <laughs> and you know, then we started doing that, and um, you know, we liked the fact that people were just mailing us money every month. So uh, mm-hmm. you know, we started looking into some more stuff. We actually bought a couple more rentals up in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is close to where I grew up, and my uh, dad's family lived there and stuff, so I knew the area pretty well. And we actually bought the same kind of units, the small condos. Um, again, it's like a pretty common thing around here. Um, but the prices there were, you know, roughly two thirds of the price of the ones in Boston, and you were getting, a, you know, about seventy-five, eighty percent of the rent. So it's like, oh, you can have better cash flow and stuff. So it all made sense. Like it made sense from all the books I read and stuff like that. Didn't work out as well. Um, they're not bad. I mean, they're not bad. I still own all of the places today, and over time, they've become much better investments. Which is one of the things with long-term real estate is. Um, mm. the giving over time. Um, but we kind of realized this was a get rich very, very, very slow. <laughs> and um, and like I said, for quite a few years, we were kind of treading water. Like, you know, we made a little bit each month if nothing bad happened. When something bad happened, we lost more or less a year's worth of cash flow. So, uh, you know, we kind of just treaded water for a while. And then, um, so I started looking more into quick turn stuff, looking into wholesaling and uh, rehabbing. And, uh, again, was sort of like in the learning a lot but not doing anything for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And in um, ooh, coming up on my fifth year anniversary of that, in January of 2010, um, basically my, my former employer decided I did not need to work there anymore. And I was like, you know what, I agree with you. So I decided to make a go of it and do the real estate stuff full time. Took a while, but like I started, you know. But then I started really taking action. I started getting out more. I started really evaluating properties, like 
with the intent of trying to buy them and started putting out tons and tons and tons and tons of offers and, you know, eventually got a couple of places and, you know, ran with them, rehabbed them, made some good money and, you know, been full time ever since. Okay. So uh, what when you were in your job, so I was going to ask you if you started out full-time so that or part-time, so that answers that question, and that's really a pretty common way that people start. Something happens that they they leave, uh, leave their job, and, you know, I talked to a whole bunch of mortgage people that are now real estate investors that had, uh, they had been downsized around that somewhere between 2006 and 2008, depending on where they were living. Like you said, the market was a little bit different in different areas because here it was definitely in the beginning of 2008. You, that was when it all happened here. But what was your background in your job? Were you in any kind of a related industry? Absolutely not in any way related. Okay. I, uh, uh, when I went to school, I got degrees in chemistry and math. And I was working in R and D chemistry when um, you know when I was working. Okay. I did go back, so on, on the, the best thing I could say about my former employer is they had very good education reimbursement benefits. So I got an I got a couple of master's degree on their dime. I got an MBA and a master's in finance with the hope of moving over to the business side of stuff and sort of like you know leveraging my hands on knowledge of the the labs with the business you know, that I was picking up there, but, you know, never really worked out. But I do have that nice little pedigree of uh, uh, MBA and a master in finance for when I'm, uh, you know, talking to bankers and other professionals and stuff and give myself a little more credibility. Well, I think, yeah, and I think that's another thing that I've uh, found a common thread with some with a number of people uh, is that they have some sort of an accounting or finance background, and it, you're right, it does make you, because you understand the business side and the number side of the business, I think you immediately walk into, you know, a bank or to a private, private money person with more credibility. I don't think there's any way that that isn't true. So I, I, think, uh, I think you can take that background. If you've got the business background and you hire the right people, I think the rest of it will fall into place. Wouldn't you agree with that? I think so. I mean, you know, obviously I'm I'm somewhat biased, but the fact that I have a strong um, understanding of the business and really the numbers, because, you know, so even before the business stuff, I did have a degree in math, too. So, like, mm-hmm. you know, definitely not scared of um, numbers and putting fancy things in spreadsheets and interpreting them and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, obviously from my bias view, I think that that's really important because, you know, if the numbers don't work, none of the other stuff really matters. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have people who come from construction backgrounds, and they can really understand the house. They can understand right. what needs to happen to it, mm-hmm. how to do it. They can maybe do it all themselves, mm-hmm. and then they have no idea how much they should pay for it and how much they're going to sell it for, and they make this beautiful house, and they lose money on it. Right, and you know you know that happens a lot, too, because if you aren't from a finance background, you know, um, sometimes I have students, and they they struggle with making offers because they – they do what I call eraser math, and the numbers are really tight. And then, well, maybe the repairs won't cost quite this much, and maybe I can get a little bit more for the house. And you and I both know that's just absolutely the wrong way to do it. You, you just you a doubt. You, you got to be. I tell people if you always have a conservative ARV and you figure your repairs on the high side and get your what ifs in there, you're going to rarely lose money if you do it that way. But if you, you flip flop those numbers, you're going to be in trouble a lot. I'll say one, I'll, you know, just make one point. I've only really stretched on my numbers one time and I've only lost money on a deal one time. <laughs> I won't say which deal it is, but you won't say what difference. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, really, and it it is the truth. And I think part of it is when you're brand new, you want so badly just to get a deal. Once you finally make that decision, you try to make deals work. And I've been guilty of that. You just it is it it either is a deal or it isn't a deal. And you just it rarely works out to try to make it work. For sure. Yeah. Uh, no so, doubt. So, so looking at your business model today, now I know you are a rehabber and you are a buy and hold landlord. 
Do you, how does wholesaling it fit into your business, if at all, if it does at all? Do you do you buy wholesale some that maybe don't fit in your uh, portfolio or your your plan? I have so um, I try to be fairly dynamic, as you mm-hmm. said. Like I am, a, you know, I'm a buy and hold guy, also a rehab mm-hmm. guy. Um, I try to look at each property and try to figure out what makes sense because you know. Not every property is going to make sense to make a, you know a 60% ARV offer on. Like you know, mm-hmm. not everyone is going to work. Even if you get it really cheap, isn't going to be a good rental. That's actually some very common around here. Um, you know, you can find places that will rent for two thousand dollars a month very easily. It's hard to find them if for under three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand dollars a door, though. Wow. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean that that condo I told you that first place that we bought. Um, Back in 2004, we paid over $230,000 for a 600-square-foot condo. Oh, my God. And that was a pretty good deal. Like, oh. it, we actually got it for a bit under what the places around it were going for. Ooh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, So, but, that, but that's sort of the point. This is not, this is not a cash flow market. Right. Um, so, anyway, um, so I try to evaluate each property in that regard. And, uh, you know, occasionally something does look good as a rental. Sometimes, most of the time they look good as flips. Obviously, something that's good for a flip, if I get a good enough price, could potentially be a wholesale as well. Mm-hmm. Um, since I mostly do the rehabs, I don't do much wholesaling. I have, um, mm-hmm. especially a couple of years ago when deals were much easier to get. There was, oh, this was a, this was a gl- some glory days. There was one day that I um, got... In a course of three days, I got three places under contract, two of them on the same day, while having like six other projects going on. So I'm like, oh, man, I have a lot going on right now. I don't know if I can do this. So then I actually did, of those three new properties, I did wholesale one of them um, because it was quite a bit farther away than um, all the other things. It was better on like the tip of where I'm willing to work. But since I had mm-hmm. so much going on, it didn't make sense to really stretch myself or you know, sit on it for a month or something like that before I could get anybody out there. So instead, you know, I didn't get a lot for it. But you know, got a couple grand, sold it to somebody who actually lived in the town, uh, so mm-hmm. they were able to get on it right away. So, um, so I guess the the long winded answer to an easy question was, I'll wholesale when it makes sense, but it's not a major part of my business. Well, and I think I think that's a, a good way to look at it because if you're primarily a rehabber, you know, I talked to somebody recently that is um, primarily a rehabber. They have a rental or two, and they had come across a deal that didn't work for them, and they just let it go. And I, I was so confused by that because I said, didn't you think about wholesaling it? Because it, what if you only make a couple of thousand dollars? You know, it's, it's the holidays and you know, who can't use a couple thousand dollars? And he said, you know, I just don't do wholesaling. And I thought, well, boy, that's just crazy. You're doing all that marketing. You know any other investors? <laughs> yeah, really. You Don't you I know mean, it's, some, somebody you can just call? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, I mean, what's, I'm, you know, you certainly know this is like networking is a huge part of this business. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, I meet other rehabbers all the time. And every time I do it, I'm just like, Hey, where do you, what do you like to buy? Oh, what do you like to buy? It's like, here, put me on your list. If you ever, if you ever find something that doesn't work out for you, let me know. You know? Yeah. It's very, very simple. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, crazy. So, um, let's talk about, uh, one of my favorite topics in marketing. Do you, do you buy, you do your own marketing or do you buy from other wholesalers? Uh, I'm guessing you do your own marketing. Again, you know, try to be dynamic. I um, I definitely do a lot of my own direct stuff. I am an agent here, so I definitely, you know, mill the MLS, put in plenty of offers on, um, you know, listed places because um, mm-hmm. obviously I have the access to it. I can easily evaluate them. And, you know, uh, for a lot of things I can get part of the commission too, so that obviously saves me a little thing. Or I can kick it back if that helps the deal, you know. Right. Um, I will actually say over you know over the course of my career I've done the best with um, getting REOs mm-hmm. and especially like HUDs and stuff like that on my with my own um, uh, what do I say putting in my own offers and stuff like that that has mm-hmm. definitely got dried up a little bit more the last couple of years I mean, geez, about two years at this point so um, so yeah so I try to do other stuff I have been doing more direct marketing one of my biggest regrets is not getting into that more early on because I didn't have to mm-hmm. yeah so you know all of a sudden it's like ooh I can't find deals on the MLS anymore now let me look into other stuff so like you know <laughs> definitely 
had a a um, big drop down in deal flow when that happened. So that mm-hmm. that there's a mistake, and you know any new people out there. Um, just because you find something that's working out pretty good for you, you should still get other, you know, the proverbial lines in the water mm-hmm. because if something ever happens with that one little thing that you're doing and it doesn't work out for you anymore, then you have a problem. Yeah, boy, that is a huge, huge thing, too, because um, a lot of the the younger investors, they came to investing about the time when all you did was go on the MLS and pick pick your, have your pick of REOs and all the other type of deals, and I – I heard, I was telling this story the other day, I heard one of them say, I guess I'm going to have to go back to one of the old ways. You know, I'm going to have to do direct mail or going to have to do this or going to do that, you know, that we that nobody does anymore. And I was thinking to myself, well, some people, even though they did the REOs and things, they, they did keep their um Oh, direct marketing and, and other lead channels open. But, you know, I think you really, in a best-case scenario, you need probably a, a good three, four, five lead channels at all times to get, yeah, get your absolutely. deals. So I think that's kind of the challenge is that as the market changes, and I think that's, that tells the tale of who's going to survive, who can adapt to the market and change the quickest. I really believe that's the secret. Yeah, I agree. Like I said, if you just if you're only focusing on one thing, you know, you're very you know it might you know it might work out for you, but at the same time, like you, you said, if if uh, things change a little bit and that particular niche is not mm-hmm. working out good, then you know you you're gonna have a problem. And like I said, that is that that's definitely what happened with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have been trying to do you know I have done some direct mail. Um, I have not had a lot of success with it, and uh, you know. I'm embarrassed to say that I have gotten away from it a little too much. I do have um, uh, the, the service I decided to go with. I have about six thousand dollars worth of prepaid stuff, so I'm definitely getting back into it. But at the same time, I don't want to. Basically, I kind of went into it really fast before, and I think mm-hmm. that I did not have good lists and I didn't have the greatest pieces. So, like, I want mm-hmm. to make sure. You know, I'm I'm committed to doing it, but I want to make sure I do it right, so I'm not just throwing like time and money away. Well, yeah, and that's the thing about direct mail. You'll get deals off of your early mailings, but uh, the statistics say you'll get 85% of your deals at or beyond your fifth mailing. So if you set up your machine, and you did it the smart way, you set it up, and it's going to go out just automatically. And then, um, you know, you, the deals will come if you've got a good list, which is the other piece of it. It's it's kind of sometimes hard to get your list targeted just exactly right, and that's that's a learning process too. But no, I think you're definitely on the wrong or on the right track here with the the direct mail. But yeah, you, you've got so many other lead channels that work for you. But this is definitely one that'll bring you some more deals. I mean, you know, if you if you add yeah, that mean, in, you know, I've I've um, listened to and read plenty of your stuff, so you know, I'm definitely. Uh, I've, I've drank the direct mail Kool Aid, even though my own personal <laughs> experience has not been that good. I, you know, I'm blaming myself and not the the avenue. Um, so, like I said, I'm definitely going to get into that more. I have been trying to build an online presence um, for some lead generation sites. Um, again, one of those things. It's like you know, look back now. It's like you know, I always thought I needed to do this, but mm-hmm. you know, when things were going going great, I never set it up. And you know, for something like an online um, online um, credibility and stuff like you know time is a big factor there so it's like mm-hmm. you know if I had just set this up two years ago even if I didn't put a lot of effort into it I would be so much farther ahead than I you know was when I eventually did do it yeah so, again, you know one of those you know, one of those things looking back you know it's uh good to be well, able to evaluate yeah. things we've all we've all done that and uh you know once did a write up for someone on the things I wish I'd done differently in creating my website creating a, a website that worked was probably one of my biggest regrets because I fooled around it with this one and I had this one. But there are certain components that a good lead generation website needs, and oh, how I wish I'd done that right because if you can get that piece set up right, then it'll start working for you 24-7. Does it happen overnight? No, it doesn't. So, you you know, for that reason, we all wish we'd been better at it two years ago. But, um, you know, I think I think that in that called inbound marketing, things that just come to you that you don't have to do anything like direct mail, then I think um, that is a, that's a huge part of what everybody should be doing now is is getting on board with that. 
But I, you're, I mean, you're always working on your business, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get it all together. So let's talk a little bit about your actual rehabbing process. You know, there's a couple of pieces of this. I wanted to ask you first of all, do you have your own crew or do you hire subcontractors each time? So I don't have, um, you know, I don't have like a dedicated crew that like just works for me per se, but I do, um, I work with GCs. I don't go okay. and hire out all the subs, um, you know, just, you know, too, too many, only so many hours in the day, only so many things to do. And, you know, it's not my, not my skill set. So if I was one of these guys who came from a construction background, mm-hmm. it might make sense for me to go build those direct relationships with the subs, maybe get slightly better pricing and, you know, would could really evaluate like how good they are. But, you know, that's not my strong suit. So I interview um the G C S. Mm-hmm. I make I make a determination. So one thing I like to see with the G, you know, uh, with the GC is to, you know, obviously the quality of work. Like that's, you mm-hmm. know, first and foremost, if they do crappy work, then there's no point in trying to go any farther with them. But um, I also like to find ones who have a little bit of business acumen because, mm-hmm. you know, they might do great work, but if they're doing it all themselves and the project's going to drag out, if they can't schedule stuff right, that's going to hang up the project. If they can't budget things well, then, you know, they run out of money and they have to, like, you know, get get draws before they're supposed to because they just don't have any money left sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So I like to work with guys who, um, you know, are also good businessmen and women. You know, I've only worked, I've only had GCs who were guys, but I've actually interviewed uh, some that are women, so I don't want to be, mm-hmm. don't want to be One- sexist. Well, no, and I think that's a good point that you make there. Um, they they need to have a good business acumen, and that, and that's not always the easiest person to find either. No. Hmm. And I also so I have, um, I have a couple people that I've worked with. I have one guy who I do try to use pretty much every time when I can, and mm-hmm. part of the reason I can do that is because he is good at business and he can work on multiple projects at the same time. And he can um, he does a very good job with his budgeting, so he never asks for money ahead of time. And he also understands the business. So you know, I might not you know he might make more doing one kitchen for a retail customer and get like you know twenty thousand dollars just for that. Mm-hmm. But he also knows that I'm going to consistently give him thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollar rehab projects. So he might not make as big a margin on every given deal, but like he mm-hmm. might have a fifty thousand dollar project he's doing in February when nobody else wants to do construction. Exactly. Uh, so, so like I said, this guy's great because he understands all that stuff, and we've worked very well. And he also does very good work, and he does a very good job vetting out his subs. And when we're in an area that he doesn't work as much, he does a very good job finding the new subs and getting decent mm-hmm. prices out of them. And he also sticks to his word. So if there's you know, like I said, if if we're in a place that um, a town that's a little bit farther than like his plumber will go out to, he can you know do, do a rough estimate on what he expects the plumbing to be, and he sticks to that number even if it you know even if the guy he gets goes a little bit over it. Wow. Assuming it's the same scope, obviously right. if there's like you know stuff that changes, like I'm mm-hmm. you know, I wouldn't expect him to absorb that, and he doesn't, and he shouldn't. But you know, if it's like a basic, hey, we're going to replumb this bathroom, you know, he knows that it'll be, you know, this particular thing should cost three thousand dollars, and the guy comes in and bids it at thirty seven hundred, and that's the best he could do. You know, he he absorbs that because that's what was in our contract. Wow, you better figure out a way to hang on to him. Well, I know. I must say, I've, I've, like as I said, I've, deal flow has gone down a little bit. So the the thing that actually works out really well is he lives um, right near all my rentals, so I have him do all my maintenance too, even though I know I could get that a little bit cheaper. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, smart smart business there, though, Sean. Uh, oh, definitely. Like you know, whatever, pay pay four or five percent extra because I mean he still gives me pretty good deals. Uh-huh. So you know, pay, pay slightly more to have you know him do my maintenance on my rentals as opposed to getting like you know a cheap handyman mm-hmm. who might not do a good job anyway. Right, uh, may or may not show up. Exactly, like yeah, I can depend on this guy, and I know he's going to do good work. You know, I pay a little bit extra for it, but not like an excessive amount. And like I said, kind of keeps when I don't have a big project going, he knows that I'll still give him like at least some work here or there, and we keep the relationship going. So yeah. Um, that that worked. That was a lucky 
uh, lucky little accident that that works out well. Yeah, and you know, though, I have to say to you, uh, from a strictly business perspective, everybody that I know that has built a big business uses GCs. They 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 step back one step from you know they move out of the position where they're the GC ultimately, and they manage the GC <laughs> because the only way you can really grow a big business is to keep re- backing yourself out of it and managing all the pieces. I mean, that's for sure. You know, I mean, there are plenty of people who do their uh, do the GCing themselves or mm-hmm. you know, even they do a lot of the work themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's fine as long as you understand. Yeah, it's like you're not going to do 100 rehabs a year right. if you are on site doing work. It's right. just not going to happen. There's just, like I said, not enough hours in the day and not enough days in the year for you to be able to do that. But if you're happy, it's like, hey, you know what, I only want to do – Five a year mm-hmm. um, or less, you know. That, then you know it, you can, and if you and if you enjoy the work and you're good at it, mm-hmm. then you know that's, that's a lifestyle choice. Like you know, right. hey, I really like I I like getting my hands dirty and doing some work. I will save some money doing that, so my profits will be a little bit higher. Or I guess, I guess my profits won't be higher, but I will save money by hiring myself to do work. Right and right. I have a friend who does that, and she's a woman. I'll go, Linda. Put putting those windows in those houses, and she'll say, "But that's my therapy. It's cheaper than a psychiatrist." <laughs> you know, she there's she she hires out a lot of it, but there she likes to go in there and actually do. She actually has the talent, which I don't have to do some of that. But I'm always fussing at her, and she says she says exactly pretty much what you said to me. I only want to do a few a year, and I like to go in there and dawdle with it. Her husband's an engineer, and. Uh, you know, that's just her thing. I think she's got about 30, 35 rentals. And, uh, but, you know, you have to make your business, you have to make your, make it a lifestyle business that suits your lifestyle and your goals. And that's what's important to everybody's well, exactly. business. You know, not everybody wants to build like this mammoth business and do tons right. of volume. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, no, there's no point in setting yourself up to do it that way if that's not what your goal is and you don't necessarily enjoy the process to get to that. Um, you know, it's I've, you know you hear a lot of people, and you know in our, in our business, there's a lot of very type A people, and mm-hmm. they are very insistent that the way they're doing it makes the most sense, and that's how everybody should be doing it. Um, you know, I like to be a little more of a realist, kind of step back, be a little bit of an independent thinker, be like, hey, you know what? Like I said, for your friend there, she really enjoys doing that. It's mm-hmm. therapy for her, and that's great. That's that mm-hmm. you know that's her fun time. It is. Um, and you know, even for me, so like I don't, I I do not at all enjoy doing work. I don't even like doing work around my own house. I will, and I yeah. can. I'm not, like I actually think that I I um, have built up in my mind I'm less capable of doing stuff than I actually am to keep me from doing it. So you don't have to do it. <laughs> but um, for a while, when we were acquiring rentals locally, um, there was there, the clauses were always screwed up. Mm-hmm. And one time, you know, we bought like some of those stupid kits and put those in, and then they would fall apart and stuff. But I actually um, like built out the shelving in like our closets at our first place, and then I started doing it all at rentals, and I actually really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was probably not the best use of like a couple hours of my time and going and doing all that stuff. But at the same time, it's like, hey, you know, I could have, I probably could have um, hired somebody for four or five hundred dollars to do this only cost me about 26 bucks for materials at Home Depot in a couple hours, and I enjoyed doing it. So that made sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. I, I think so. I think I think there's a, a balance in in all of this for sure. 